Welcome to Points West and BBC News Channel Special with Sibet Chowdhury and Alex Lovell. The story tonight, murdered and butchered by her stepbrother. Nathan Matthews is guilty of murder and Shauna Hall of manslaughter after they killed the Bristol schoolgirl Becky Watts. We couldn't believe it. Uh, we couldn't take uh, it in. And Nathan and Shauna have been arrested and body parts have been found at the address. Tonight, Becky and Nathan's parents tell Points West of the tragedy that struck at the heart of their family. We also have the inside story of the police investigation that ended so close to home. We'll find out how the teenager's death brought together an entire community. And we remember Becky, the innocent teenager, murdered in her own bedroom. Good evening. Becky Watts was killed and dismembered by the stepbrother she trusted and his girlfriend. Today, it took the jury just over three hours to find Nathan Matthews and Shauna Hall guilty of her killing. It was an act of violence that has ripped a family apart. Becky's family gave this reaction outside court. From the day Becky died, the kindness shown by us by the people of Bristol and wider has been immeasurable. For this, we will always thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Over the over the months, we have also found strength in messages and support from strangers all around the world. For us as a family, today is not the final chapter in this tragedy, but now we can at least begin the challenge to rebuild our lives. Though they've been together for most of Becky's life, Darren and Angie Goldsworthy married just two years ago. Angie's son Nathan was best man and Darren's daughter, Becky, was bridesmaid. No one could have known that just months later, Nathan Matthews would murder his stepsister at home in her bedroom. Before the trial, Darren and Angie spoke to our reporter, Fiona Lambden. She seems so quiet when I were here now. Eerily quiet. You've got a child like Becky, you're just used to noise. And then when it's not there, you really notice it. They were like brother and sister, and they acted like it as well. We was a little family unit, weren't we? Yeah. We'd be a little dysfunctional because we're all from, you know, with different parents and partners and all that sort of thing. But um, no, we all we all linked together. We was quite a strong little unit, which is why it was such a devastating shock that he'd done this. Darren is Becky's dad. Angie is Nathan's mum. But together they raised Becky from the age of three. Nathan lived nearby with his granny, but spent most weekends with them. There was a big age gap there, though. I mean, she was three, Nathan was 12. He was pretty good with her, to be honest. He used to take her around all the adventure playgrounds for the smaller kids with all the ball pits and things like that. He would go in with her. And ironically, her first clear word, and she didn't speak until she was three, was the word Nathan. She said, oh, Nathan. It just stunned us all. It's really hot anyway because of the microwave. 13 years later, Nathan, her stepbrother, murdered Becky in her bedroom. Tell us about what it was like when she went missing. I never believed, not in the early stages, that she had actually been killed. The anxiety of thinking that she was out there getting abused or assaulted and all. Your, your imagination absolutely running riot with horrible things that could be happening to your little girl. And I was determined I was going to get her back. But if you can see this, get in contact. And if anyone out there knows something, just tell us. Just bring her home safe. If you've got her, then put her somewhere we can find her. We want her home, please. <laughs> but it's the not knowing. It was just ripping your heart out and stamping all over it. I lost nearly four stone in weight. Uh, I couldn't eat. I could barely keep water down. It was a darkness that just wouldn't leave the house, wasn't it? It was... I, I couldn't put my worst enemy through it. Six days after Becky went missing, Darren and Angie were moved out of their home as forensic teams moved in. We were in a bed and breakfast out on the A38 when we were told 
that it'd become a murder inquiry. We couldn't believe it. Uh, we couldn't take uh, it in. And Nathan and Sean had been arrested, and body parts had been found at the address. Um, and we just wanted to die. Our whole family, everything we knew, had just been ripped away from us. And then when they told you what had happened? I was sat on a bed, rocking violently backwards and forwards, screaming, I wanted to kill him. Um, the police weren't sure if I would do any harm to Angie, but obviously they don't know our relationship. They just don't know how strong we are. I'd just been told my uh, daughter had been murdered and butchered. Her body parts found in suitcases and bags in a garden shed. I was just devastated. Well, Angie just went into shock. You could see it. I just couldn't accept it. Yeah, well, your son, my daughter, wasn't it? Tell us about Nathan. A loving son. I would have described him as. He, he's never lied to me. He's always been open and honest with me. You know, I loved him like he was my own son. Don't now. I hate him. Nathan's girlfriend, Shauna Hall, came into the family six years ago. She always put herself across being very timid and mousy. She always I... used to get her own way, though. And to be honest, I didn't like her, first of all. I couldn't put my finger on it, but there was something off about her. So I never truly believed in her. I sort of became more accepting of her and relaxed a little bit and even loved her like a daughter, didn't I, in the end. Two years earlier, Nathan was best man. Becky and Shauna were bridesmaids, a united family as Darren and Angie got married. They say forever, despite this incredible strain. My love for her is immense. It really is, yeah. and it's unwavering. And I will, I've lost a couple of members of family because I won't turn on her. I will never desert her, never. If this doesn't break us up, then nothing's going to. Becky was murdered here, in her bedroom. I've put her bedroom back together now, so it's all how it was. Wasn't always as tidy as this, I can, I can assure you. But, um, yeah, this is how she likes it. I don't really want to leave here because Becky this lived here. This is the here. only house she ever knew live, she lived in. It's now been nine months since Becky died. I just miss her. I wish she was still here. I miss everything, even the arguments. <laughs> yeah. Ten o'clock every night, I expect that door to come and her to come through. It. Oh, cook us some tea, Dad. But it never does. But every night I still look out, I still listen, listen out for it. It's ridiculous. She's been gone months now, and yet I still listen out for it. Well, I've been in close contact with Darren and Angie ever since Becky went missing. And today, outside court, Darren said to me that he was in complete shock. The family have had to wait nine months for these verdicts. And as they were read out, Darren and Angie clung to each other. They were absolutely sobbing. And as Nathan Matthews was taken down, Darren looked at him. He looked at the man who has murdered his daughter, the man who is his stepson. But Nathan Matthews couldn't give him any eye contact. He was just looking straight down on the ground. This is a family who've been completely ripped apart by this in a very public way. It's been played out in front of the world's media. But everyone who has observed Becky's family, who have seen Darren and Angie coming to court for the last five weeks, day in, day out, say this is a family who have handled themselves with utter dignity. Fiona, thank you very much. Fiona Lambden reporting there. Now, Becky was first reported missing by her dad back in February this year. It led to one of Avon and Somerset Police's biggest investigations. At its height, hundreds of police officers searched dozens of locations across Bristol. It ended when Becky's body was found in a shed just metres from Matthews and Hall's home. Here's our Home Affairs correspondent, Steve Brody. 
It was on the morning of Thursday, February the 19th, that Nathan Matthews and Shauna Hall decided to drive to Becky's house at 18 Crown Hill in St George's. They were the last people to see her alive. 24 hours later, she was reported missing by her father, but she was already dead. Well, we know that now, um, but from the moment that police officers arrived at that house, um, Nathan Matthews uh, misled us and lied to us. And as a consequence, the huge investigation that followed to try and find Becky alive was clearly going to be um, unsuccessful. She was already dead. Becky had been suffocated at her home, probably in her bedroom. She did put up a fight. She was covered in bruises. Uh, she received significant injuries to her, around her face and mouth and head. And uh, clearly the evidence is that, that she did fight and she was fighting for her life. The pathologist found she'd also suffered up to 40 other injuries. After death, other significant stab wounds, slash wounds and injuries were inflicted upon her body. Nathan Matthews and Shauna Hall misled the investigation. Matthews had already dumped the body in his car and taken it back to the house at 14 Cotton Mill Lane. Over the following weekend, he bought a power saw at a local DIY store and was captured on CCTV with Shauna Hall buying cleaning equipment. He says he cut up Becky's body in their bathroom. He used the saw uh, to dismember her body and at that point, um, we know now that she was uh, cut up into eight different parts which were then very carefully wrapped um, with cling film and with other bags um, and uh, you know some care was taken by him to absorb moisture and to prevent, um, prevent the body parts from uh, smelling and decomposing. But no forensic traces were found in the bathroom. In these circumstances he's also thoroughly cleaned the bathroom which again was a telling piece of evidence because if you're clearing up after you've done something wrong, you have made it scrupulously clean so that there would be no DNA left or blood samples or hair of, of Becky. Meanwhile, the police were appealing to the public. There was very heightened concern for what had happened to Becky and at that stage we were actively trying to find her alive. The same day, the police suddenly found they couldn't contact Nathan Matthews and Shauna Hall. Well, that's a very significant day because uh, Nathan and Shauna clearly didn't want the police to go to 14 Cotton Mill Lane and, and made themselves absent and difficult for us to, to track down. But in the dead of night, Becky's body was moved 80 yards to a garden shed here at number 9 Barton Court. The police were still frantically searching areas of Bristol, hoping to find Becky alive. And then they finally caught up with Matthews and Shauna Hall. She denied knowing anything at all about Becky's disappearance. I heard stomping down the stairs. That's what made me think that Becky had left in a mood. And at the same time that that was happening, uh, a number of other lines of inquiry were being followed. But ultimately, there was a significant development in the case um, which turned uh, Nathan Matthews and Shauna Hall into suspects. Police found Becky's blood and Nathan Matthews' fingerprints on the doorframe of her bedroom. What actually happened between them is something that, that we may never know. On Saturday the 28th of February, the police arrested both Matthews and Shauna Hall on suspicion of kidnap and later for murder. When questioned by detectives, Nathan Matthews broke down and admitted killing Becky. He claimed it was an accident and he had just meant to scare her. Because, like, to try and basically make her more appreciative mm -hmm. of life so she'd be more appreciative for other people. She'd be, like, he says he wore a mask and taped up the teenager's face and eyes before punching her and forcing her into a suitcase. Matthews then told the police where Becky's body could be found. Shauna Hall maintained that she knew nothing of what had gone on. I don't understand how we could have done it to us. <laughs> when they got to Barton Court, officers found a body cut up in a number of bags, boxes and suitcases. The long search for Becky was over. I think for all the officers that have been involved in this, that evening and the days that followed were some of the most horrific 
and uh, and difficult um, that 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 they've probably ever dealt with, and I hope ever do deal with, um, to find a uh, the body parts of a dismembered 16-year-old girl is just truly horrendous. She'd been missing for 21 days, but the searches, the appeals, the heartache, all proved to be in vain. The 16-year-old had been dead from the beginning. I think Nathan Matthews uh, will live with what he's done for the rest of his life. He has uh, taken away the life of uh, his stepsister in a horrific way and what he has subsequently done has, um, has had a lasting effect on everyone that's been involved in it. Um, he will live with that for the rest of his life and only he knows how he feels. Matthews and Hall will find out how long they'll spend in prison on Friday. But who was Nathan Matthews, really? Well, his mum, as we heard, described him as an honest boy who never lied to her. So what drove him to murder the stepsister that he'd grown up with? Andrew Plant looks back at what led up to that fateful day in February. There are a couple of are ways... You gonna have to, are you going to have to read that statement? No. In his police interrogations, Matthews repeatedly asked for his girlfriend's name to be left out of the interview. I don't want that to be read to someone. But was this real remorse or the calculating act of a cold-hearted killer? I don't want to read this out in full again, Nathan. But what he was the devoted son who tore his own family apart. Nathan Matthews grew up with his grandma living in Warmley in the east of the city. At 16, he'd gone to study here, finishing his first year of an electrician's course at the city of Bristol College before dropping out in year two. Nathan Matthews' interest in the armed forces goes back a long way. He first became an army cadet here in Cadbury Heath when he was still a teenager, not far from his grandmother's house in Warmley. And later in life, he would join the Territorial Army. It was during those years he learnt some of the skills that he would later use in Becky's murder. The court heard he was given weapons training and lessons in decontamination, particularly with a powder used by soldiers to absorb liquid. It is found in cat litter, and cat litter was found on top of Becky's body parts in a shed in Barton Hill. The way that the packaging was wrapped up, uh, the salt crystals in it, so, you know, so there was no smell coming from Becky's body parts, uh, the cat litter that was used. So somebody who comes over as a rather pathetic figure actually seems to be a very devious and manipulative individual who has pre-planned the kidnapping and murder of his stepsister. During his trial, members of the Territorial Army gave evidence in court and gave a glimpse into a man with few acquaintances and even fewer friends. He had a cheeky confidence, said his former cadet instructor, but by the time he joined the Territorial Army, his temper was beginning to show. One witness said he would sometimes snap, sometimes throw things in frustration. Everybody in it and not use her name. He told police he was psychologically disturbed. You wouldn't corner a rat, he said. If you do, the rat will fight back. But despite these hours of interviews and the weeks on trial, much of Nathan Matthews's motivation for murder remains a mystery. Andrew Plant, BBC Points West, Bristol. Now, there were four other people arrested in connection with this case. Becky's body was stored in bags in Carl Demetrius and Jaden Parsons' shed. The couple insist they didn't know what was inside the bags, but both pleaded guilty to assisting an offender. Now, Carl Demetrius' twin brother Donovan and James Ireland pleaded not guilty to the same charge. Today, the jury agreed and the two of them were acquitted. Alex. Well, Becky's murder was a crime that tore a family apart, but galvanised the local community. People living in the St George area turned out in their thousands, firstly to help search for Becky and then to mourn and remember her. Laura Jones reports. The St George area of Bristol. It's a tight-knit community. People who live here tend to stay here 
generations of families often living within just a few streets of each other. Becky too had spent almost all of her life in this area. She lived just down the road, went to school just a few streets over there. She was just an ordinary local girl and so when she disappeared it really touched a nerve with people here. She could have been their daughter, their granddaughter, which prompted them collectively to do something, anything to help. As news of her disappearance spread, this community responded. A huge search was organised. Hundreds of people giving up their time, desperately looking for one of their own. And that determination to help didn't change. As the days dragged on and the news went from bad to worse to unimaginably awful. Two, A balloon launch was organised to remember Becky, to show her family she would never be forgotten. A march followed which brought the centre of Bristol to a virtual standstill. Minutes silence were held at football matches. For her family, the attention was hard, but made them feel less alone. I mean, the people of Bristol are absolutely best in the country. They really are. They're so supportive. I mean, both our football teams, you know, um, did a minute silence. City's done there in Wembley Stadium and National Stadium. So for that time, the whole country knew who Becky was. And if she if she was there, she wouldn't have believed it. Just a few weeks ago, a baby apple tree was planted for Becky in this local park, a symbol of growth and hope. What I thought you saw right from the beginning was a coming together of this com uh, community with a genuine concern and wanting to support the family in any way they could. What happened to Becky changed this area and the people who live here. Today, some nine months on, of course, life has gone back to normal for most of them. But this remains a community that we'll never forget. Laura Jones, BBC Points West, St George. Well, now we break away from our main story tonight, as today is, of course, Armistice Day. And across the West at 11 o'clock this morning, thousands of you fell silent to stop and remember. Well, now we return back to our main story tonight and the innocent teenager at the heart of it. Those who are closest to Becky are now taking their first painful steps into a life which doesn't include the daughter they loved, the friend they adored. But they've told us all about the girl she was, the girl who will always live on in their memories. They'll never forget. Their worlds have been shattered. Memories of conversations, yeah. meals enjoyed, hugs and dreams shared. They remain fixed in the minds of those who loved Becky. Even as a very shy young schoolgirl, her teachers saw something special. I would just remember her as this hard-working, caring, smiling. She was quiet, she was shy, but there's a lovely person, a really lovely little girl, and a really, really fabulous member of our class. She was perfect. Her house was her haven. She had few but precious friends, and home was everything. She had tons of confidence with us. She felt secure and safe. Um, but the minute she went out for that front door, she was completely, she was timid and mousy. And, but we were always doing little challenges, me and Bex. Um, like the curry challenge, which has been uh, seen by quite a few people. All the way through, Becky's um, childhood, nearly every photo we brought of her, she's hanging off Angie's neck, like a little chimp. 
There were challenges, an eating disorder, arguments at times. But her best friend remembers a happy person full of life. Her memory box of mementos is overflowing. She enjoyed life. She wasn't, like, she wasn't what I would call troubled at all. Like, every teenager has their problems, but she was, she did, she was happy. Like, there was a lot of things going, like, nice in her life. Like, she was confident in things that she was, like, good at, like, with her makeup and her hair. She was very, like, like, friendly to people. She was nice to people. She always said what was on her mind. We had a lot of banter and lots of, like, we used to joke around a lot and I think we kind of relied on each other. It's like, we were like partners in crime. <laughs> And now the pain of living without Becky and the task of holding on to what made her special. I'd like her to be remembered for all the things she did. I mean, she was such a big hearted girl. I just miss her. I wish she was still here. Well, tonight I'm outside Becky's home with the family's blessing. Nine months ago, Becky was out on a Wednesday night in February playing skittles with her friends. She then went on a sleepover. The next morning, she came home and went through that gate for one final time. She was then murdered in her bedroom. Her family and friends would never see her again. Today, her uncle paid tribute, saying, for us, the family today, it's not the final chapter in this tragedy, but now we can at least begin the challenge of rebuilding our lives. Fiona, thank you very much. That's it from us this evening on the day Becky Watts killers were finally found guilty. Do stay with us on BBC One as the weather is on next, but from both of us here, good night. Hello, very good evening to you. We are going to find some changes now in the weather as we head over the next couple of days. It's all courtesy of a deep area of low pressure named Storm Abigail, which is running its way up towards the northwest of the British Isles over the next 24 hours or so. Now, for us, it's not going to have a direct influence other than to bring a windy spell of weather, particularly so later through tomorrow evening and some wet weather to come with it. But prior to then, we will still have another mild day. Now, the changes afoot are notable if you watch out towards the west of this sequence as that area of low pressure Abigail moves up towards the northwest of Scotland. You'll see the isobars tightening up there as we head through later tomorrow. There comes a cold front that will give some fairly sharp showery rain later through tomorrow evening before clearing away to introduce some colder weather once again for Friday. So for the rest of this evening then, barring a little bit of drizzle here or there, courtesy of a weak front, it's a largely dry picture. It'll stay that way through the course of tonight, but the skies will clear quite significantly compared to some recent nights, and that will lead us into a noticeably chillier night too. Indeed, some parts of the countryside perhaps as low as 5 or 6 Celsius, all of us, I suspect, in single figures by tomorrow morning. So a noticeably chillier start, yes, but it should be a brighter start. A fair amount of sunshine around first thing in the morning and then steadily the cloud will start to increase. A bit of showery rain can't be ruled out here or there, but many areas will remain dry until we get later on into the evening. By that stage, the wind's picking up and as that cold front comes across, some quite squally gusts of wind perhaps getting up to about 40 to 50 miles per hour in one or two spots. And some of those bursts of rain could be on the heavy side as well, albeit fairly temporary in nature. So temperatures tomorrow prior to then getting again into about the mid-teens but as that front comes through later tomorrow evening, you can expect a drop of about 5 Celsius in a fairly short space of time. So, OK, standard autumn weather, it has to be said, but a noticeable change compared to the weather of late. Here's a look then towards the future. The weekend will turn wet and windy as we head through the course of Saturday. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.